All right, so I'm actually going to turn this. There we go. It's better lighting. So uh, today's lecture, we're, we're going to focus on, on multi-period models for asset prices, and we're going to look at how the continuous time limit for multi-period models work out. And at the end, by the end of the lecture, we'll understand uh, how to calculate the so-called Black-Scholes formula okay, within this uh, continuous time limit setting. So before we go on and, and cover the new material, as always, I'd like to review what, um, what we've done last time. And in the last lecture, what we looked at was the following situation. We were considering the very simpli most simplistic version of, of, um, of a discrete time model in which there are two tradable assets. And in that case, there was a risky asset and a risk-free asset. And uh, we said that um, there were a couple of conditions that we looked at. One was the so-called no arbitrage condition. And the no arbitrage condition says that there exists no arbitrage in the market if and only if, so maybe I'll just uh, write that out explicitly, if and only if there exists some probabilities, Q, such that the initial value of the asset is equal to the discounted value, the discounted expected value of the asset. Okay? And this, in fact, had to be true for any tradable asset in the market, not just asset A and that money market account, but any potential tradable asset. So let me change A here, and let's just call it some general C. So for any, for any asset, any traded asset, C. Okay. Uh, that's basically the most important result that, uh, that we found. And this result came about through this idea of replication. Right. So one thing that we did before even going to replication, actually let me remind you of the other point. The other main point was without actually, um, uh, if we take this statement here and we actually choose A to be the asset C, this implies a no arbitrage condition on AU and AD and R. Right? We can just take this expression here and we can see that one is also equivalent to the statement one is also equivalent to saying that the assets are ordered, the asset price that's tradable are ordered in this way. It's equivalent to that. In other words, this statement is equivalent to the so-called risk neutral probabilities. And these things are called risk neutral probabilities. These risk-neutral probabilities are, uh, in fact, um, probabilities. They're, they're, out, they're within this range, 0 and 1. Okay. Those were our key results. And this, um, the way that we basically showed, well, the way that we showed this, first of all, this, this requirement on AU and AD was we constructed arbitrary portfolios, which were potentially arbitrages, and then, then looked, at the, look at, looked at the cases where uh, looked at the values of AU and AD such that we could avoid arbitrage, and we realized that this, if AU, AD, and R are in this range, then we can avoid arbitrage. And I asked you to think about the implication in the other direction, right, to show that no arbitrage implies this. So there's really an if and only a statement. In order for us to see that expression that for any contingent claim, or sorry, let's say for any asset, we have this expectation result the way that we found this result was via replication. And let me remind you of the basic idea. So the basic idea is you take alpha units of that contingent claim, beta units of the second contingent claim, and if you combine that portfolio together, then you will end up with a linear system for the two values in the states of the world, and what we do is we ensure that this is equal to the contingent claim 
or the, or the secondary asset, the one that you're trying to value, in both states of the world. And the implication, the no arbitrage implication, is that the initial value of this portfolio must, in fact, be equal to, so this, this sum must be equal to the initial value of the contingent claim. Otherwise, there is an arbitrage. Right? And you, in fact, in your little quiz session, you, you, you did exactly this exercise. You worked this out for a couple of numbers, and you constructed an explicit arbitrage when C0 was not equal to the value of the replicating portfolio. Okay, so that's um, one of the, the key things that we ended up uh, showing in the last lecture, and it's something that some of you may have seen already as well. What I'd like to do today uh, is go on to this continuous time thing, but I also wanted to revisit the example that we didn't complete at the end of last lecture. So at the end of the last lecture, we were thinking about how do we apply this in a situation where it's not just two outcomes at every time step, but multiple outcomes. And I was doing one explicit example. So I'm going to do another explicit example. These are not exactly the same numbers as the end of the class, but that's okay. We'll, we'll reconstruct from the beginning. So let's take an asset here that has um, these three values. It can take on those three values in one time step. And another asset can take on these three values. So this is a risk-free one, and the first asset is a risky asset. What we'd like to do, what I'd like to show you again, is go through this whole analysis and see, ask the question, first of all, does there exist an arbitrage in this market? Okay, that's the question. Is the market arbitrage-free, or does there exist an arbitrage? How would I answer that here? So there are two approaches we can take, right? One is the direct approach, that means try to construct an arbitrage and then see whether we find conditions under which we can or cannot. The other thing is simply impose the risk neutrality criteria, try to find a probability measure under which the asset prices are equal to their future valued expected discounted. And if you can find such a Q, then there is no arbitrage. And if you can't, then there is an arbitrage, right? We have those two approaches. So let's do both approaches, okay? So let's go through the direct approach again. Okay. So the direct approach just says, okay, if I want V0 to be 0, and I'm going to choose, in the direct approach, we'll choose alpha units of asset A and beta units of asset B. Okay. If I want that, then it's clear that beta has to be negative 100 alpha. Right? You must short 100 times the amount of the risky asset that you, that you took. And if we do that, then this portfolio, then this portfolio will start off at zero. And the three states, so if we're in the, if we're in the up state, we'll get 110 times alpha minus 100 alpha, so that's 10 alphas. If we're in the middle state, we would end up with nothing because 100 times alpha minus 100 times alpha is zero. And in the down state, we would end up with negative 10 times alpha. Okay, so the logic goes as follows. If I want to find a, an arbitrage, I must have, okay, so we can say for an arbitrage, we must have the probability that V1 is greater than or equal to zero. This must be one. So I must never lose. All right, I cannot lose. So we can ask, what values of alpha allow me to construct such a portfolio? Well, the only value of alpha that can do that is if alpha equals zero, because I have some states in positive and some states are negative. And if alpha is, if alpha is a positive number, then the up branch there is a positive number, which is fine. The middle branch is zero, which is also fine. The bottom branch would be negative, and that violates this condition. So that would not be an arbitrage. And if alpha was negative, then I'd have exactly the opposite. The top branch would be negative, the middle, which already violates this condition. So we already know that we can't have a negative alpha. We won't satisfy this. And we can't have a positive alpha. The only alpha that satisfies this is alpha equals zero. But then, but then the probability that V1 is strictly positive is also zero because you end up with zero in all states. And in order for us to be an arbitrage, we can say, but an arb 
also has whoops, probability that V1 is greater than zero has to be strictly positive. So therefore, there are no arbitrages. Right? That's our direct approach here. But it requires this, this very sort of strict logical argument, right? You have to start with, let's look at all potential arbitrages. They have to start at zero. Let's make sure that we satisfy the condition one of an arbitrage. Okay, that puts a criteria on the portfolios again. It puts another restriction. So that's our second restriction. That sec those, two first, those two restrictions already force enough constraints on our system that we are pinned down to one portfolio. And, those, and that one portfolio violates our third condition for arbitrage. Therefore, there are none. So we can therefore safely conclude for there are no arbitrages in this market. Okay, now what about the other approach? So the other approach is the using the risk neutral probability approach. So for the other approach, we must have the condition that A0 must be equal to one over one plus R times the expected value under Q of A1. We have to be able to find such a Q, find such a probability. Now in our situation, that means 100 equals one because the discount rates are one here. Okay, look at our branching probabilities. In fact, let me just make this small for a few seconds so you can see it all at once. Okay, so you get 110 times Q up plus 100 times QM plus 90 times QD. Okay, that's the condition that we need to solve. I'm going to make it bigger again now. Okay, so we need to see, can we find Qs? And the condition, of course, that these Qs our probabilities implies that this sums to one and all of these are strictly positive. Okay. That's sufficient and necessary. Alternatively, I could say each Q is between zero and one as well, right? And then, and that they sum to one. But if they're all positive and they sum to one, they have to be probabilities. So we, we're looking, we're seeking such cues. Okay, so let's just go ahead and, and plug it into our system. And we can easily see here that uh, if we put, for example, QM equals one minus QU minus QD, right? That satisfies my first constraint. Then the 100 would cancel on both sides. You'd have 100 equals, and then you see you get 110QU and then you subtract 100QU, so that's 10QUs. This is just algebra. Right. And then the next one is negative 100QD plus 90QD, so that's minus 10QD. And the conclusion here is that actually QU must be QD. Okay. So let's call that little q. Okay. This is just a parameter, right? Some parameter. Okay, and then we go ahead and see if we can satisfy our constraints. Our constraints are that all the Qs have to be positive. We've already satisfied that they sum to one, right, by making the replacement of QM. So the last thing is all of them have to be positive. Well, QU being positive and QM being positive, these both imply the same constraint that little Q is positive. Now, QD being positive, on the other hand, that implies 1 minus QU minus QD is positive. But QU and QD are both equal to little q, so that's 1 minus 2 little q is positive. And that tells me that little q has to be less than a half. So we have, uh, we have two constraints that we've seen come out of this. We have this constraint here and this constraint there. But clearly, a Q exists, a probability exists. As long as if Q is between a half and zero, then there exists 
no arbitrage. Because if Q is, if little Q is between this range, then the actual branching probabilities, Q, U, Q, M, and Q, D, are in fact probabilities. They're in the range zero to one, they sum to one. So a risk neutral measure does exist. Therefore, there is no arbitrage. Okay. That's always the criteria that you seek when you use the risk neutral approach, is you try to find risk, a risk neutral measure, as long as you can find one. There may be many. And this example here, you see there are many. And uh, what I want to do is explore this, this idea that there are actually many possible cues. What does that mean for the valuation of another new asset that we throw into the mix? It means something a little bit interesting. Uh, but before going there, let me make sure, are there, does anyone have questions about this logic for the second approach or for the first approach for that matter? We're good? Okay. So what I'd like to do now is um, uh, I'm going to continue with this example in, in a minute. But before doing that, um, I'm going to get, let me tell you why I'm, what I'm going to do continuing this example. I want to continue this, amp, this example and I want to see can we find the value of a claim that say does, I don't know, this. It pays that. 5, 6, 10. Any three numbers. It doesn't really matter. How do we value it? Well, we know from the risk neutral probability rules, we must have the value of this new claim has to satisfy that same discounted expectation result, right? Where the expectation is, is the Q expectation. So we know, in fact, let me pull this and I'm going to put it uh, down below. How to value that thing. So if we call that asset B, according to the risk neutral expectation rules, since there is no arbitrage, and to avoid arbitrage further, we must make sure that B0 has to be equal to the expected value of B1. But we have a problem. The risk neutral measure is not unique here. We have, we've, we found in, the, in, in going through this approach, approach number two, we found a whole range of risk neutral probabilities. And that's kind of interesting already from something that you may have not already seen uh, when you did this in your, in your previous course on, on um, binomial models. You may have only ever seen that assets have one price, compute discounted expectation. But here's a clear example where that is not true. And what would, you know what, uh, let's, uh, I'm going to simplify the, the payoff just to make the question really, really, let's, let's make it, let's do this. Let's do 0, 10, 0, 10, 0. Okay, just so our payoff is really nice and simple. So according to this, according to this risk neutral expectation, uh, we've seen it from above that the branching probabilities have to be, uh, so there's a 1 there first of all. The, we'll get 0 times q, little q, which was our parameter. We'll get 10 times qm, but qm was 1 minus 2q. And we'll get 0 times little q again, which was our other parameter. And we see that here the answer is 10, minus, 10 times 1 minus 2q. So the range of b, b actually can take on a number of values. And um, that range of values, we can see what does it range over. Well, that's a linear function of little q. 10 times 1 minus 2q is a linear function, so it takes on a max and a min. And it takes on the max and the min at the two endpoints. Right? A little q equals 0 and little q equals a half. If little q equals 0, the maximum value is what? 10. Right? And what's the minimum value? 0. So that, this is a little weird at first when you first see this, it tells us that if we have a market in which there are three possible outcomes in one time step from now, and there were two assets that were traded in that market, and we avoid arbitrage, so th there is no arbitrage with just those two assets, if we throw a third asset into that mix, its price is not unique. 
anything in the range zero to ten dollars is perfectly viable. It's a perfectly viable no arbitrage price. So all of these values, any such B0, is a viable no arbitrage price. That says viable. So allowed, okay? They're, any of those are no arbitrage prices. And I urge you, suppose you, you now take, take any number in that range, B0 equals five, for example, and um, try to use method one, which is the explicit construction of arbitrages, try to use method one and see to convince yourself, actually, there is no way for you to construct an ARB. Take any number in that range. So just try it and use method one. We know from method two, uh, whatever B0 you choose there will give you a unique Q. So uh, what I mean by that is, suppose somebody went ahead and told you that actually the price is B0 star. It's some B0 star. They tell you, three, two, 8.9. Okay, that's the market's price. From that, you can find little q, can't you? Right? I can just easily, I can say, little q clearly equals um, 1 minus b0 star over 10 times a half. Right? So no matter what price someone tells you, if it's in that range, this little q will still be in the range 0, 1. And it's in that range by construction, right? Because we kind of just did a little closed loop. We said, with asset A in the money market, to avoid arbitrage, or I shouldn't say to avoid arbitrage, with asset A and the money market there, the implied Q, the implied risk-neutral probabilities do exist, and they imply that this little Q has to be in the range zero and a half. And then we said, throw an asset B. Well, if little q is in the range zero and a half, the price of asset B is bounded above by 10 and below by zero. So if I take any value be between zero and 10 and I work backwards, I have to get a little q between zero and a half. It's just trivial, trivial arithmetic. And uh, that will avoid arbitrage. So what I'm asking you to do as a check of sanity on your own is to use method one take a B in that range, use method one, and convince yourself you actually cannot construct an arbitrage. So what's the intuition then? So now, now, now let's step back. That's what the math is telling us. The math is telling us there is no unique value for this asset. So what is the intuition as to why there is no unique value? And why was there a unique value when, when we had that other example that we looked at last lecture? Anyone want to venture? An answer? There's a very good financial reason for it. Yeah. Well, it, it, I mean, the specific B that I would choose in that range would depend perhaps on my personal risk aversion level because now there's a choice, right? I can choose anywhere between zero and 10. And if you look at the payoff, zero is the minimum that you can get, and 10 is the maximum that I can get. And so it seems that, okay, well, who, someone who's very risk averse will charge almost not, will pay almost nothing. And if they were selling it, they would sell it for almost all. Okay, that's true. But what I'm asking is a little bit different than that. I'm not asking how would I pick one of these prices. I'm saying why does there exist many possible prices? No, there's no bid and ask spread here. Yeah, bid and, there, there are unique prices, right? For, for, for the traded assets in the market, A is uniquely trading at $100, and the money market is uniquely trading at $1, right? Those are unique prices. What I've done is I've also put in another thing. This is a unique set of potential outcomes, 0, 10, 0. But why? Okay, there's another... Very good. 
So the idea is that how did we come up with this concept of, of um, no arbitrage that had to satisfy the risk neutral expectation result? What did we do? I reminded you just now at the beginning of the class. We took two traded assets, we took linear combinations of them, and we replicated the third, right? We traded the two things. Let me go back one slide. Okay, we took those asset A, we took the money market account, and we made a linear combination of those things such that the value at time one was always equal to that third asset, no matter what the outcome was, whether it was the up state or the down state. And that's the replication idea, right? This is the so-called replication. And when I replicated in this way, I found a unique portfolio that allowed me to replicate. Now imagine doing this replication, attempting to do this replication in your current uh, situation where you have three outcomes. There are two traded assets. So let's, uh, let's say try replication, okay? So we've got 100, 100, 110, 90, alpha, 1, 1, 1, 1. This is beta. And we can see that if we combine these two things uh, together, you get 110 alpha plus beta, 100 alpha plus beta, 90 alpha plus beta. And if we're attempting to do replication, we will want this to be equal to the B in the up state, B in the middle state, and B in the down state, right? That's what we like. But there are only two degrees of freedom, alpha and beta. So this linear system is overdetermined, right? Or, yeah, we have two unknowns, three equations. We may be able to satisfy, in fact, you can satisfy, take any two of the ones, take any two of these equalities, take any two, and you would find a unique alpha and beta. But then the third one, you will not. There will be no unique alpha beta. Or sorry, I shouldn't say there will be no, you will violate the third equation. So if I took equation one and equation two, the first, the up and the middle, if I solve for alpha beta there, I would, I would definitely get BU and BM, but then I will not get BD. So you cannot use replication arguments to, act, to construct the value. And because there is no replication to construct the value of that extra claim, it, what it means is that that extra claim is actually like a really fundamentally new asset. Unlike when there are only two outcomes, the extra claim, the extra asset that you throw into the mix, it's not fundamentally a new asset because you can build it out of the other two. Right? In the case when there are only two outcomes, you can take a combination of those two to make that third thing. So these two assets are really the same thing as that third one, or a linear combination of these two are the same as that third asset. Third asset doesn't add value, does not increase the amount of outcomes, does not do anything for you. Now, the third asset does something new. And because it's doing something new, it is allowing it, you, you have a now a new degree of freedom to, to put a price on it. Let's think about this pictorially, or, or geometrically, because there's an interesting geometric interpretation as well. So let's suppose, uh, let's go back to the case of just the two, and let's, uh, just for the sake of having numbers in front of us, let's go back to this case, all right? And we're trying to replicate some, some asset, okay? If I interpret, I'm going to draw axes here. Whoops. Man, I can't draw straight lines. I need this tool. OK, 
Okay, what I want to do is I'm going to interpret those two axes. What they represent are the value in the up state and the value in the down state. Okay, U and D. This is D, this is U. If we take asset A, asset A is somewhere 90 and 110, so it's kind of, it's somewhere like that. It's kind of a vector, right? This is a point 90, 110. This is representing asset A. Asset A in the down state will take on the value 90, and in the up state will take on the value 110. And if I take the money market account, the money market account is just, uh, it's a straight line with slope 1, that's 1, 1. Right? If I think of them as vectors, these two assets, and I think of a linear combination of those two vectors, what, what does a linear combination of two vectors do for me? It's going to span a plane, right? And it's going to span exactly this plane in the, just this two-dimensional plane. It'll, it'll, you can get to any point in this plane, no matter where I am. I can get to that point by taking some linear combination of this, of, of this vector and some linear combination of this vector, and I will be able to produce something that points to any particular place, and let's call that BUBD. Okay, that's my, that's my asset that I want to find. So in this two-dimensional case, in this case where there are two outcomes, I can get to any point on that plane by trading in those two assets, unless what? There's one situation where I won't be able to do that, even if it's two-dimensional. What if these two arrows are pointing in the same direction? They're pointing, they're collinear. Right? So if they, were, if they were basically pointing in the same direction, with the same, or, or opposite directions, right, collinear then I couldn't span anywhere. Then I would just be able to go along a line. But if they're not collinear, then I can get to any point that I want. What's the interpretation in terms of this three asset or three outcome situation? Well, now I have, um, now we've got, instead of, instead of a point in 2D space, we're going to have to describe what happens in the up state, what happens in the down state, and what happens in the middle state. Hmm. Well, that's close enough to the center. <laughs> so that's, um, that's like U, M, D. Okay? And we just put a point on there, and that's going to tell me where asset A is, and that's like uh, 110, 100, 90, and then there's the, the money market account, which is just, again, a straight, that's just pointing off in the direction 1, 1, 1, and if I take a linear combination of those two things, which would be my general portfolio, what am I going to do? I'm only going to line a plane, right? This will not span the entire three-dimensional space. Instead, I'm going to land on some sort of plane Mm. something like that, right? If I take a linear combination of those two vectors, I will be in some sort of tilted plane. That goes through the origin, but it's some sort of plane. And if asset B, in general, asset B is going to be somewhere there. It's going to be BU, BM, BD it will not necessarily land in that plane. And so there is no linear combination that will get me there. All right, there isn't one. So there are certain choices, there are certain Bs, there are certain claims, there are certain assets which would lie on that plane. And those assets I could get to. And so you can think, if you think ahead really quickly, that means for certain assets there is a unique price but not for every asset, right? For any asset that lands in that plane, there will be a unique price. But if you're off, there won't. So what would, so given that there is no unique price, what do you think is a reasonable price? What's another, so we could try to incorporate risk aversion and go through the similar kind of analysis of this indifference valuation stuff that we did in the first class, but now with three assets in the mix. And I said it's a little bit, 
it's possible to do it. It's just a little bit annoying and long, detailed algebra. But if we think about intuitively, and particularly this picture in front of you, is there some point, is there some way that you could think graphically of getting a unique price that makes sense for the general asset? Remember, you can't, before unique prices were we found because we were able to exactly replicate the claim. Now we know we cannot do it in general, but what's the next best thing? What about minimize the least squared error? Something like that. Minimize, take all possible portfolios that you can make and find the one which is as close as possible in the L2 sense to your claim. Doesn't that kind of make sense? And what does that mean geometrically? Well, it simply means take the plane, put up a perpendicular, find the perpendicular that goes through that point. Goes through, goes through the asset's point. So uh, that would be there. All right, that's a, whoops. That's a, ugh, damn it. Trying to sh draw a nine, you know, that little perpendicular sign that you usually do when you see a triangle and it's a 90 degree triangle. Is that picture reasonably clear to you guys? You see what I've done? I've just projected onto the plane in a perpendicular way. And now that point that touches the plane, this, uh, this point that's on that plane here, that one, I can get to that. That's a point that I can trade using my asset A and my money market, and I can get there. So if I do that, I would get the replication of the, of the payoff that is as close as possible in the L2 sense, right, in least squared error, in sort of squared error sense, from the claim that I'm actually trying to value. And that would be a unique point. It would be a unique portfolio. Right? It's two, you have two, two vectors, you're trying to get to a point, so those two vectors, there's only a unique combination that will get you there. Right? There's a unique value that, uh, so this gives me, this gives me a unique alpha and beta, which would imply a unique quote unquote price. Now it's not really a price of B, it's a price of the claim that is as close to B as possible, right? Or price of asset. Okay, and uh, maybe we can call that thing, that, that asset there, let's call it B hat, okay, that one. So what we've done is we've created a new asset B, B1 or B hat such that B1 minus B1 hat, when we square it and we compute the expected value, and this is actually the expected value, here's the interesting question, is do I do that expectation under P or under Q? Under the real probabilities or under the, uh, the risk-neutral ones? All right. So um, the question's still open. No one's given me an answer yet. P or Q? How many people think that we should use the P measure there? The real world probability measure? Just a couple, okay. How many think we should use the risk neutral probability measure there? More than a couple, okay. So the most of you are wrong. The P measure is the correct thing. Because why, why is it the correct thing? Because you are trying to minimize the error in your replication. If you think about it, you're trying to minimize the error of the actual outcome. 
You're not trying to minimize the error of the fictitious outcome. Cues are not real probabilities. They do not actually happen. They are simply there to tell you whether arbitrage is in the market or arbitrage is not in the market. And it so happens that asset price is given by an expectation in terms of those cues. But that cue itself does not tell me the probability of the real outcome. The real probabilities are the P's. So you should be minimizing the expectation under the real world probability of the squared error. And then you find such a B1. Okay? You find that. And then you price this thing. So this is, I'm just writing below what, what I mean by that diagram, okay? So this perpendicular thing, is it's orthogonality, but not orthogonality in Euclidean space, right? Because they're not equal probabilities. It's orthogonality that are perturbed by your probability. Yeah. If it's perfectly perpendicular, well, then, then the price is zero, right? That's the closest point. If I, if I have a plane, okay, take, rotate into the, into the frame of the plane, so the plane is flat. Okay, you can always rotate things around so your coordinate system is flat. And you're saying, what if B is right here? Well, what's the closest point to B? Zero. The value of that claim would be zero. I shouldn't say, that's not the value of the claim. That's what this principle would tell you to value the claim at. Right, this principle would say the claim cannot be valued, or the claim's value is worth nothing. Why? Because there's nothing you can do to hedge it. Right? The best you can do is put zero in everything. That's it. So that's the value that you would associate with it. Whether you can actually find somebody willing to buy or sell in that way is another question altogether. Right? This does not tell me that the market will allow that price. This just tells me this is a rational approach to giving a value to something for which I don't know its unique value. Right? All I know is that there's, there's a range of prices given by the risk-neutral expectation, just like, um, just like what we have here, right? There's a range, oh, sorry, I need to slide up more. We found this range, and we're trying to understand what is a reasonable range, okay? Now, you notice if B is always positive, if it, if it always makes a positive payment, B would not be perpendicular to my plane. So there will always be some positive portion to it. Do you, do you realize that? If B had all positive components to it, or at least non-negative, then B is hanging out somewhere in that quadrant in this direction, right? Somewhere in this quadrant. So it's clearly not perpendicular to the plane, which is somewhere sort of slanting in, this, in that direction. The point that will be closest to B is very typically in the way I've drawn it, and it wouldn't be at zero. So very typically, you'd have a non-zero price. Now, the interesting question to ask at, that, at this point is, does such a pricing mechanism lead to no arbitrage prices? It's not obvious, is it? Right? We started off by saying, OK, there is no arbitrage with A and money market. There is none. And if we want to value B, B's got to be in the range 0 to 10, according to the, the, the example we did. And now, if, now I've sort of thrown that all out and I said, okay, there is no arbitrage. I don't have a unique price. How am I going to think up of a unique price? What's a reasonable principle? And here's a reasonable principle. Find a portfolio that's as close as possible that I can get to by, rep, by trading in my, in my traded assets. Find a portfolio that gets me there in, uh, uh, in the closest possible way in the L2 sense, in the square sense, and value that claim and say the value of B actually is the value of B hat. Right? That's a principle. I didn't use anything about arbitrage. I didn't use anything, anything sort of foundational there. But an interesting question is, does it lead to no arbitrage prices? And I'll leave that open for you to think about. Okay? So if you want to think about it, do it. This is, not, this is a, not a trivial question. It's not very hard. It's not trivial. So uh, let's say, 
So B1 hat is the, oh, so what is argmin? It means the thing which, min, which attains the minimizer there. Okay, so you find the B1 hat that actually gives you the minimum. And then you say that the value of value of B is equal to the value of B1 hat, which is 1 over 1 plus R expected value, or sorry, not 1 over 1 plus R. It would be the alpha times A0 plus beta, okay, which replicated it. All right, so then the question is, is this arbitrage free? It's an interesting, more slightly theoretical question to work, about, work on. This strategy, by the way, this is called the risk um, minimum variance hedge. Such um, minimum variance hedge price. Okay. So what does hedge hedge here? Hedge means hedging in the sense of removing risk. You're doing the best you possibly can to remove risk. Right? Because you found the B1 that minimizes this error as much as possible. Now remember, again, these B1, this B1, these hats are only those portfolios which you can get to by trading an asset A in the money market. Okay? That's, they're, they're only those ones. They're not any arbitrary ones. They're only the ones that... Um, so if you like, you can think of this as alpha A1 plus beta, in fact. Right? That's the most general portfolio from trading in the asset A and the money market. Yes? Yep. Yeah, but some will be negative. Some will be negative and some will be positive in order for that to happen. Yeah, so, but that's because if some, so if all of them are negative, you won't have this situation either. You'll only have it, you'll only have the projection being at the origin if some are negative and some are positive. And it's okay for an asset which has in some states of the world positive outcomes and in some states of the world negative outcomes to be valued at zero. It's a perfectly viable asset or perfectly viable price, seems like. And you can actually prove that, yes, these are, in fact, no arbitrage prices. So I'll let you know ahead of time. The answer is affirmative, and you can try to show it. Okay, any questions about this, um, this discussion? No? All right. Okay, so uh, I think I'm going to... Stop the discussion. Let me see. Was there anything else I wanted to say about this case? No. So uh, now I'll stop the discussion about this uh, non-uniqueness in the market. Sometimes that's also this is called non-unique or incomplete market. So let's put that little title here. Okay. So it's incomplete because what does incomplete mean here? Incomplete just means that when you throw the new asset into the mix, you cannot replicate it from the other two. Okay? You can't. So that's what it means to be incomplete. When there are more outcomes than there are traded assets. That's what it means in the discrete setting. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's uh, uh, before going for a break, one example just to show you that there are cases which it is unique. Let's think up of the following claim. Um,
Okay. I just had to do the quick calculation in my head. So what about a claim that does this? Zero, 10, 20. Okay, this is my claim. Same, so we're doing the same, continuing that same example, okay? All the same numbers are flowing through. So what is our B0 supposed to be equal to? One times 20 times Q plus one minus two Q times 10 plus uh, Q times zero, right? According to this example. And here you can see, you see I've chosen something very judiciously. The 20 Q cancels at two Q times 10 and you're left with exactly 10. So even though this market was in general incomplete, we found a unique price for that specific asset. 20, 10, zero. It's actually valued at $10. It's unique. And this is going to the point that I said before that not all assets lie, so if we slide back up to our diagram, the generic asset does not lie on our plane, does not lie within the span of our assets, but certain assets do land in the span. And those assets will have a unique price. Okay? And this is an example of one. So you can try to think up of some others, right? Probably, what would happen if I put the 20 in the down state and zero in the up? Same thing, right? It's actually valued exactly the same. If instead I had uh, 20, 10, zero, this is also gonna be valued at $10. You can easily check that. And then the other, of course, there's another natural exercise here. And that is, what if, What if B0 equals 11 in the market? There's an arbitrage, right? There has to be an arbitrage. How would you find it? So you can think about that as, an, as, an, as a good exercise. Find the ARB. Okay. So maybe that's about it for this uh, topic um, uh, for now. Would you like to take a break before we start the, uh, the multi-step? Okay, let's take a break. All right, so we're going to start something new now. Uh, we're going to be looking at the continuous time limits and continuous time version of these discrete models. And we're going to do this in the most simplest setting, back to the, two, back to the situation where there are only two outcomes at every step. And uh, the reason is, is basically just for simplicity. You can also formulate this analysis when there are multiple outcomes at every step. So, so far, what we've been doing when we talk about uh, these traded assets is I've been telling you effectively what is AU and what is AD and what is R and also the initial price A0, either value through indifference or I just give it to you, right? We've been saying, here's a picture, I'll give you these numbers, go ahead, value a third claim. But if we want to think about having this model say something about the way that assets are actually behaving, we have to go and figure out what are reasonable, what are reasonable models for AU and for AD itself. How should, we val how should we write those down in order to replicate behaviors that we actually observe? And in order for us to understand that, we need to talk about a multi-period setting. And um, before going to the multi-period setting and taking its continuous limit, I just want to say something about two steps. How would we use what we've developed so far in two steps for valuation? And then come to the question of, of how, would, how should I write this in terms of observables, okay? How to write in terms of things that we can actually observe, okay? Because you can't observe what the few, two future outcomes are. It's not something you actually have access to. So far, we've assumed that. We said, suppose we can, then all of the stuff that we've done makes sense. But 
In principle, we actually have to have a way of figuring out what are those two possible outcomes? And in general, what are the multiple step outcomes? So let's discuss, uh, discuss just two steps of the model, first of all. And just stylistically, I'm not going to write down a lot of details here. Um, so one way to, to think of a two-step of the model is to imagine the situation where once you get to the second step, there are two further outcomes. Right? So I start off at some value here. I get to either I move up or I move down. And if I move up or I'm down, then again, I can take on two other values. And if I'm in this state, I can take on these two values. And you could keep going on forever like this, right? You could make this into a multi-period setting. And this is a perfectly reasonable approach, but there's one main problem with it. The main problem is that the number of points, the number of nodes that you have after making a total of n steps is 2 to the n. It grows exponentially. And that's just the number of nodes at the end. So if you sum them all up, you, of course, get more. Right? This is going to grow, basically, well, certainly geometrically, exponentially. So this is far too many. So we need to think of a way of modeling that reduces this, um, this complexity, okay? this computational complexity. And the way that is often done is by designing what are called recombining trees. Okay? So this is just a binomial, a gen a generic binomial tree, but there are, there are other kind of trees that are called recombining. And the idea here is very simple. If I think of the two-step case, when I make, uh, if I go up and then down, I want it to be equivalent to going down and then up. So I want this path to give me the same value as that path. So if I wrote down the values for, say, a single asset, we would have had AU, A0 going to AU, and then here it would have been AUU, and in this node it would have been AU and then D, and here it would have been AD and then U, and here ADD. So when we recombine, we make those two things equal. That's what implies recombination. And the advantage of recombining is if you imagine going out to multiple steps here, it's purely a computational one, actually. But you can imagine if I go out to multiple steps, how many nodes do you get? You always just add one more, right? It grows linearly. Okay, so here you've got two, here you've got three, one, two, three, four, here you've got four nodes, and if you sum them up, it'll grow quadratically. Okay, so this is little o n squared, or big O n squared, it's of order n squared. Something like n times n minus one over two, or something like that. Well here, this is of order exponential, clearly of very different nature. So there's a huge advantage to doing this. Okay, make sense why we're going to use re recombining? Okay, so now let's, now let's go forward and say, okay, let's suppose we use a recombining tree to model two assets, and we ask the same set of questions that we asked in our last lecture. We asked about, does the model have no arbitrage? Um, what are those conditions? If we take those conditions and then we add it and we assume there's no arbitrage, we throw in a third asset, how do we value that? Okay, so we'll readdress all of those questions very, very quickly because it's actually extremely simple. Once we've understood the, um, the one period case. Okay, so here's our asset A. And over here, let's put our money market account. I'll just call it M. Okay. 
And notice I've only put a subscript on it. It's the same, oh, that should be 2, m sub 2, m sub 2. Okay, so these are equal to 1 plus r, 1 plus r all squared. All right, just grows at the risk-free rate, okay, just for simplicity. And let's say I give you this, these values. I gave you some numbers there. How would you decide whether this system admits an arbitrage or not? What would you do? Well, you could use the definition. The fundamental definition is you set up a trading strategy and you check to see whether you can find a trading strategy which starts with zero value and at some point in time has the, has the, 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 the uh, criteria that you never lose and you sometimes win. Right? Those, those are the three things. But now you have to rebalance the portfolio. Right? So if I started... If I originally started with some position in alpha, let's call it um, alpha zero, uh, I'm going to, darn it, I'll draw it on a separate tree here. Alpha zero, beta zero, this represents my portfolio. Positions in, in, in asset A and the position in the money market account. Once I get to the next time step, I'm allowed to change that in principle. I don't have to have the same alpha and beta anymore. I can change it because... I'm allowed to trade. And I would have some new value, alpha 1 up, beta 1 up. And down here, once I get there, again, I could in principle change it to alpha 1 down, beta 1 down. And then the story's over, right? So I only get to change it once. But is there a condition that I have to impose on these strategies? Can you think of a condition that I have to impose on the, on the new alphas relative to the old ones. Well, think about it financially for a second. You put $10 in one asset, $5 in another asset. You've waited one period in time, and you're now going to change it. You're now going to change the number of units, so let's re restate it. I put $10 worth of my money in one asset, and that may have cost me one unit of asset. I put two units, uh, I, and I bought two units of the other asset, so one, two. That's my portfolio. I hold that to the next period. I'm sitting here now. I now know whether the asset went up or it went down. I'm now going to change my portfolio from one asset, uh, one unit of asset one and two units of asset two to something else. What constraints do I have? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Remember this concept that I mentioned briefly last time about self-financing. I have to be able to use, I, I can only buy and sell whatever I get from the strategy. So one unit of asset one and two units of asset two are currently worth some amount of money, currently worth a fixed amount. And all I can do is buy assets worth that fixed amount. That's self-financing. So let's write that down in equations. I must have that... Um, once I go from, so if I bought this many originally, how much is that worth at this point in time? It's worth alpha zero, A1, whatever A1 happens to be, plus beta zero, M1, whatever M1 happens to be. And here M1 is always one plus R. Okay, that's how much money this, this system is now worth. And after rebalancing, I have to ensure that I hold this same amount of money. Okay? So if I'm, in this, if I'm in this state of the world, I have to make sure that alpha 1 times u, a u, the new value of my asset. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Alpha 1, so this is my new amount of alpha 1, of, of a, plus beta 1 u of m1, that has to be equal to this amount of money in the up state. So that has to be alpha 0 a u plus beta 0. And if you want, you could put this as m u here. It doesn't really matter. Right? The money market account is the same in m u and m d. 
Does that make sense to you, this equation? This is self-financing. I have this amount of money in my hand available because I had alpha zero units of the asset. It's now worth this. I had beta zero units of the money market account. It's now worth that. And in the upstate, that's the bottom line. And I rebalance now. So I have some new position, alpha 1u and beta 1u. But those are degrees of freedom that I get to choose. But I'm constrained. I can only choose it so that I self-finance so that I don't throw money into the system or pull money out of the system. And if you're in the down state of the world, you of course have a similar, basically the same equation, right? Oh, this is with the alpha A1D. And that has to be equal to, again, MD. You could also write that. Um, you can also write that same system in general here. Alpha one times a one plus beta one times m one has to be equal to alpha zero a one plus beta zero m one. Okay. Both of those equations can be encapsulated like this: my new position times a new asset value plus my new position times a new asset value must be equal to the old position times the new asset value plus the old position times the new asset value. And if you rewrite this, you can see that you can write it like this. The change in my position times A0 plus the change in the position times M0 must be 0. Times M1, sorry, must be 0. So in other words, any money that you put in one has to come from the other. That's it. Okay? Does it make sense? So this is a self-financing condition. Okay, so if we were asking again, going back to that question that I originally asked, can I find arbitrages? Well, it will be a little bit difficult in this setting, right? Because I've got to find, I've got to check, uh, put in a portfolio at time zero that has zero value, go one time step, make sure I'm satisfied the self-financing condition, try to find a, note, a portfolio again, which now has the conditions that I never lose and I sometimes win. That's what I need to do. But is there another approach that you could take? that may be able to avoid this. Well, today's class, we talked about two approaches for just the one period case. We said the explicit direct construction by using the definition of no arbitrage or inducing the risk neutral probabilities and seeing whether or not the risk neutral probabilities really are probabilities, right? So we're going to, so let's talk about how, how can we adapt that idea here? Well, the, the, the approach is actually quite simple once you do one very simple thing. Circle this. Now, what do I mean by circling that? Well, think of the following situation. You are at time one, and you are in the state U. If you are in that state, there are only two possible outcomes, AUU and AUD. Those are the only two things that could happen. And M could either, and M grows to 1 plus R squared. Okay? M just multiplies as it always does. So if I look at those two circles, and then I think through the logic that we had before, I'd realize that if I start there, I have to avoid arbitrage, or sorry, avoiding arbitrage is equivalent to the existence of Qs for that branch. It implies that if I can find risk-neutral probabilities just for those, that portion of the tree, then there is no arbitrage in that portion of the tree. Then you go to the other portion of the tree. And you say, okay, 
Let's look at this portion of the tree now. Compute queues there. If those queues are also between 0 and 1, then there is no arbitrage from there going forward. Then finally, you focus on this portion of the tree. And then you say, well, there's no arbitrage in the future steps. And if there's no arbitrage in this step, then there is no arbitrage anywhere. There can't be any. So that's all it is. It's exactly the technology that you've already developed. There's nothing new to add. All you need to do, the only, I guess the only new twist, let's say, if we want to call it a twist, is that each of these branches, they have their own queue. So there's a QUU associated with that branch. There's a QUD associated with that branch. And there's a QU associated with that branch. And these don't have to be the same. Those queues don't have to be the same. They could, in principle, be all different. And if all of them are between 0 and 1, oh, zero and one then there does exist a risk-neutral measure on the whole tree. And if there does exist a risk-neutral measure on the whole tree, then there is no arbitrage. So you see, this approach doesn't require you to try to use, impose a self-financing condition and do all of those little intricate computations. Right? It simply boils down to a linear algebra system for three, part, for three parts of the tree. Okay, and just to be very clear, let's um, say, what, what is the linear algebra system that I'm solving for the, um, uh, I don't know what color that is, this, 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 uh, this portion of our tree? What would it be? How am I going to solve for the QUD? What equations would I write down? Well, I'd write down AD equals 1 over 1 plus R times QUD AUD plus 1 minus QUD times ADD. And I solve for QUD. Right? That's it. There's nothing more to it. And then similar kind of system for the yellow circle and then for the purple circle. So it's a little bit of annoying calculation, but it's straightforward. Right? It's three linear systems. Make sense? Questions about that? Because okay? I'm not going to do an example, right? You can cook up your own example and try it out. Or look up in the notes. Uh, look up in the book, sorry. Okay, so now, so at this point we can answer, so let me write down a statement here, by the way. So if, um, I'm going to put that in brackets because that's sort of not the approach we're going to take. We're going to say this is the direct approach that's in the brackets. Instead, talking about the Q approaches, if there exists a risk-neutral measure Q such that, you know, any A at some T equals 1 over 1 plus R, expectation under Q of A at T plus 1, then there's no arbitrage. Right? And in particular, this is, this is really an if and only if statement, right? So we can modify this. We can say there exists a Q such as that if and only if there is no arbitrage. So find QU, QUD, QDU, and check that they're all in the interval 0, 1. Okay, and that will be, then, then there won't be arbitrage if that's true. The algorithm, Claire, and it just follows from what we did last time. Okay, so now uh, let's answer the next question that we usually asked, or that we have asked in the past. Suppose we've done that exercise, and we've found there is no arbitrage. Okay, and you can guess what the no arbitrage conditions are going to be, right? right off the bat from here. 
you know, remember that ordering of the assets? AD is smaller than 1 plus R, A0 is smaller than AU. Well, basically that has to hold for these three different nodes. That's basically it. Nothing more. So the next question that we usually asked were, was, uh, throw in a third asset into this mix, put in an asset B. How are we going to value the asset B? And what information are we given? So let's draw that. So I'm going to repeat the diagram I have up there. And this time I'm not going to put the values in the nodes. I'm just going to draw it like this. Okay, this is my asset A and my money market. We throw in asset B, and what if I tell you the value of asset B here? How do we figure out its price? We have two approaches. One is risk neutral expectations. The other is replication. Okay. If we already did the exercise in part one, checking for no arbitrage, if you've already done that, then you already know the cues in this tree. Right? Remember, this tree here is not a different tree. It's the exact same tree. We've just split them up right, into three. So this tree, the branch, the probability of going here is still the same QUU. This is still QDU, and this is still QU. It's the same one. The risk-neutral probabilities are the same one. So what we can do is the same kind of exercise. I can focus in on this part of the tree, and I can use the Q risk-neutral probability, and I can find BU equals 1 over 1 plus R times the expectation under Q, which would be QUU, BUU, 1 minus QUU, BUD. Okay, that's just the straightforward approach. Alternatively, if I wanted to replicate, what I would do is look at this part of this tree, look at this part of the A tree, take a linear combination, and make the linear combination only in that portion of the tree replicate this portion of the tree for B. And that would give me a unique portfolio at that node. Right? So if I did this, I would find an alpha 1 up and a beta 1 up. And the replicating value would, out, would be equivalent to this. Right? It would have to be the same. And then uh, the other, then you can just repeat the exercise, right? Go to this node there and there. And at that point, you would have computed the value of B. Um, you would have found, sorry, you would have found BU and you would have found BD. Right, by doing this procedure, either the replication or using the discounted risk neutral expectations. And once you calculate those two, then you focus in on the last portion of the tree. So those three circles. And again, the system is identical. So you've reduced this whole problem of computing multiple time steps into a whole sequence of little binomial models, right? That's all they are. They're just a sequence of little binomial models. And if you did this, you know, how many millions of times you had some gigantic tree and these are really small steps here, okay? Like that. All you do at every single point in this tree is the same exercise. Okay, you just recursively, you just focus in on some little node here, compared it to there, there, and then it's the same old binomial story. Nothing new. Okay? Good. Are we happy with that explanation? And I think some of you have already seen that before, so it shouldn't be completely new. All right, so now what I'd like to do is, is go on to discuss um, what's an appropriate model itself, because now we have a way of um, taking a model. If I've given you these values, A, A and all of those nodes, 
we now know how to check to see if there's if there's um, uh, if there's free of arbitrage, and then we also know how to go ahead and value a new claim, a new asset. But now we ask the question, what's the appropriate model? Okay, that's what we're going on to now. So we've got time, so I'm going to go with that. What's the appropriate model? So let me reflect it back to you. What is it about the price or the dynamics of the asset price that you would like to capture using this model? What's the most basic things that you can capture? You see asset prices moving around, right? That's what they do. They move around and in general there's some sort of, there may be some positive return and there's some fluctuation. So you want to at least capture the return, expected return, and the variability of that return. That's what you want to at least capture from based on your historical observation. And if I can have a, if I can have a, a discrete binomial model that somehow reflects that same characteristic, then I can be confident that at least I'm getting the first two moments correct in the behavior of the assets dynamic. And then you can do much more complicated things. But for, for now, that's all we'll do. OK? So let's talk about how um, we would, we would um, go about and, and do that. Well, imagine having a set of observations of the asset. So you have a set of observations in history. Or in fact, let's put these at, at a, a number of historical times. And equally spaced, OK? two, dot, dot, dot. You have this whole sequence of historical observations. These are observed. And what we'd like to do is at least compute the return of this historical observation. And we'd like our model to replicate that behavior. So let's look at how would you calculate returns. There are two ways to do it. If we look at the return over any time period n, I could compute just the, uh, the, uh, the sort of uh, relative return, which is this. Agree? There's also another type of return that's, uh, that's a little bit more um, useful for our purposes, and that's the logarithmic return. So you take the logarithm of the ratio of the asset prices and you compute these things historically. And then you might say, well, why one versus the other? And my one answer to you would be, well, actually, they're not that different. It looks like they're completely different, but they're not that different. Here's why. Subtract one, add one. OK, sorry. Let me um, not do it directly in there. Let's do it here. So we've got this ratio. Call that ratio alpha, OK? Subtract 1 from alpha. Add 1. That's a log of 1 plus or 1 minus 1 minus alpha. Agree? Yeah. OK. Then I would say um, alpha is the relative price, right? Alpha is this ratio. It's this, uh, it's this ratio that's showing up there. Is that ratio generally very big? Is that ratio generally close to some number, close to 0, close to 3, close to 3.141592653589793284141? No? It's close to 1, right? Normally. So uh, what I've underlined there is actually close to 0, generally. So I can do a Taylor expansion. I have log of 1 plus something small. Well, 1 minus something small. And what is that approximately? You're going to need your Taylor expansions in a minute. Quite a, uh, you're going to need quite a few of them in a minute. So do you remember this? Log of 1 or 1 plus x is approximately what? x, isn't it? Minus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 3, dot, dot, dot. OK. So this is approximately min alpha minus 1. 
1 plus x is approximately x. You have 1 minus x, so just flip the sign. I guess I could have kept this as plus alpha minus 1, and we get alpha minus 1. Plus dot, dot, dot. Higher order stuff. And what is alpha minus 1? Well, that's a tn over a tn minus 1 minus 1. And you can see that this is actually more or less the same thing. So this logarithmic return is approximately the same as this relative return. But there is an advantage to working with the logarithmic return. So here's, here's the, the story for the advantage. Suppose I told you that we were going to assume that these returns are normally distributed. First order approximation, right? We're thinking of perhaps central limit theorem type thoughts going through our mind. The returns should be independent of one another. Presumably, they have finite variance. So presumably, they're going to, at least in the long run, look like some sort of long normally distributed random variable, or sorry, normally distributed random variable. So if we thought the returns were normal, and we use the first version of things, what could potentially happen to the asset price? It could become negative. So if we use the first version of things, assuming R is normal is not actually going to be accurate and could lead to theoretical problems. If I assume that the second type of return is normal, now I'm perfectly fine because a log of something positive could be negative for sure. If it's less than one, it's negative. So that's the reason why we're going to deal with the logarithmic return. going to use this. Okay, so I've told the story, said that we have this historical asset prices, we compute these historical returns, and we're going to compute an estimate of its mean and its variance. Okay, so we get from the data some estimate of the mean and the variance. And how would I, so if I view these as uh, R is actually a random variable, right, and I want to compute the expected, the real world expected return, or sorry, expected value of this return. And let's say that from observations, we find that it's equal to something called mu star. Okay, that's just the observation. And how did I compute that by, from observations? What's my estimate? You're all actuaries, right? I have a random variable, I have a bunch of observations. You can compute in this, an estimate of its mean. Sample mean, right? Nothing miraculous here. Just compute the sample mean. Now, because of something that's going to happen later, OK, actually, sorry, I won't tell that story yet. I'll come back to it in a second. Now, what about the sample variance? Or the estimate of the variance? We can call that sigma star squared. OK? And again, I can compute that. Well, we can, we can make it the unbiased version. Let's not bother. OK. So we have some estimate of the variance. We've observed it. Now, because of two things, we're going to modify these expressions here. First, first point why we're going to modify it. Suppose I did these observations daily, and I told you the return was 0.1%. Mm, okay? Then that really means what annualized amount? So it depends on if you continuously compound it, etc., right? But if we just did simple interest, we would say that we'd have to scale it by the how many days in a year. So when you talk about returns in finance, you usually talk about annualized versions of things. So we're going to annualize this thing, first of all. And variances, as well, will be annualized. Variances, if, they're in the, if the random variables are independent, then the variance of the sum is just the number of terms, is just the sum of the variances, right? Variance of sum equals sum of variance if the random variables are independent. So we would simply scale it. And this would tell me that I'm measuring them in an annualized quantity. 
So the stars, mu star and sigma star, are annualized things. There's one more correction that happened. And this is going to look a little weird. Why put this in now? It comes in because later on, it leads to a cancellation that allows you to interpret mu star in a very particular way. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, OK, we've got data. We calculated the daily return or the, the, the period returns. We estimate, we estimate the, um, um, the mean of that random variable and the variance of the random variable. And we simply call that estimated mean and that estimated variance in this way. We just define it. So mu star and sigma star are equivalent to estimations of the mean and variance modified to be annualized and modified to correct for what is called a convexity correction. And you'll see why it comes in later on. Why I put it in there. I didn't have to put it in there. And all of the theoretical work that I have derived does not require me to put this there. But for me to interpret mu star in a particular way, I do require it. Okay? It's only for the interpretation that I need it. For the mathematics, it's not necessary. I could have called everything in the round bracket there mu star instead. Okay, is this clear at this point? We've gone through, got historical data, estimated the mean, estimated the variance. This is what our data says. Now we want our model to behave this way. Okay? That's what we want to do. We want our model to replicate this behavior. So here's what we will do. We'll say, um, let's take, let's, we're going to make our model, uh, because, because we know that returns should be independent of one another, these logarithmic returns should be independent of one another, then our model should more or less look the same through time. It should be stationary. So it shouldn't depend on where I am in time. And for that reason, I'm just going to draw generically one node in my giant tree. So if we take, you know, we have in general some giant tree here, and I'm only going to take this little node in the middle there, and I'm blowing it up. And we're going to say that at that node, our asset price is whatever it is, and it's going to take on two values. It's going to go to either grow. Remember, we took logs before when we talked about return. So that's why I'm putting an exponential factor here, because when I take logs, then the exponential will go away. So it's going to grow by some factor C or decay by some factor minus C. Why do I make this particular choice? At this point, it's a modeling choice. I'm just simply thinking of it as the asset goes up or down. I didn't have to make it symmetric. But if I didn't make it symmetric in, this, in log space, right? it's symmetric in log space, not, in, not when you remove the log. But in log space, it's symmetric. If I didn't make it symmetric in log space, I'd find I have too many degrees of freedom. We only have two things to match, mean and variance. And what's the other parameter that I have to play with here? So C is one parameter. What else? The branching probabilities. P, the actual probability of the outcome. I have two parameters, P and C, and I've got two things, two observables that I need to match, mean and variance. So that's enough. I can't throw in a third. I can't put E to the C and E to the minus D. I'll have over-specification. I mean, I could, but then I'd have over-specification. And I'd have to use some other thing to decide on what should D be. OK? So I'm trying to give you a rationale as to why this form. Make sense? OK, so what we're going to do now is we're simply going to find what is the appropriate P and what is the appropriate C, which allows my model to behave like the data. OK, that's the goal. Because now we'll have a sound way of, of stating how an asset should be modeled as opposed to before where I simply said the asset for sure has these two values in one time step. Now I'm saying go to the data, estimate these things, build a model that behaves like the data. Okay? All right, so it's actually quite simple now. Now it's just a matter of some simple algebra. Okay? 
from the model. Let's compute the expected return. Well, what is, the, what is, what is R actually in this case? It's log of A, E to the, one way that I can write, rewrite this asset actually at time one, let me um, put one more little note here. One way that I can write this asset to time one is to say that asset at time one, time step, or at any time step, n, in fact, equals its value before times e to the c times little x n. And what is little x n? All of these little x's, x1, x2, dot, 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 these are iid Bernoulli random variables. Okay? But they're not standard Bernoulli. They're not 0, 1. Instead, they're plus minus 1. So the probability that any one of the x's equals plus 1 equals little p, and the probability that any one of these little x's equals minus 1 equals 1 minus p. Okay? Okay, so if I compute the, uh, the return, you can see that the return at any, uh, the returns, they're all identically distributed. They're log of a n divided by a n minus 1, and that's just c times x n, right? The return over any nth period. So what I need is I need the mean of this return. I want it to be equal to mu star minus a half sigma star squared times delta t. And that has to be equal to c times the expected value under p of xn, and that's equal to what? What's the expected value of this Bernoulli? 2p minus 1, right? p times 1 plus negative 1 times 1 minus p. Maybe I'll do that in two steps for you. 1 times p plus minus 1 times 1 minus p, right? x takes on those, th those are the probabilities plus or minus 1, so it's just that. So that's c times 2p minus 1. So in fact, you immediately get the branching probability, the real branching probability, in terms of c, if we knew what c was, and the observable. So we can just check immediately this is just 1 half, 1 plus mu star minus a half, sigma star squared, all over C, times delta T. Okay. Oops. Okay, the next thing that we had to do is match the variance. Well, from the data, this was sigma star squared delta T, whatever that is, right? We just get that from the data. And uh, we've got uh, the variance of a Bernoulli. Well, it, the variance of R is the variance of C times X. So that's C squared times the variance of X. And what's the variance of X? Well, that's the mean of X minus the square of its mean. The mean of X is 1, right? Because it's plus minus 1. So if you square it, it's always 1. Maybe I'll write that in two st stages for you. And we've just computed this thing. It's 2p minus 1. So we've got 2p minus 1 all squared. Yep. Okay, and now we can just uh, replace. So from the top line there, we know that 2p minus 1 is equal to this divided by c. So we can use that to replace this 2p minus 1 squared. Okay, I just underlined it in purple. I don't know if you've seen it. Let me, let me highlight it for you. I'm going to use... This equals that to replace that. 
So we get c squared 1, sorry, 1 minus um, mu star minus a half sigma star squared. There's a squared there, there's a squared there, and there's a squared there. Okay? And therefore, so you can see the c squared cancel in this denominator here, and all I have to do is take the sigma star delta t and add it to that. Or alternatively, we can write this in the following way. I can find that C equals, since C, again, C could be positive or negative, so let's just take the positive root, okay? And I'm going to factor out um, sigma star delta T, and I'll get 1 plus the square root of 1 plus mu squared minus 1 half sigma star squared all over sigma star and this would be squared, and that would be delta t, and there would be a big square root on this thing. Okay, so I'm sorry, I'm going through this slightly annoying algebra just because I need to show you what the correct order of magnitude things are at. So these are our two final, these are our two equations. They're not our final ones yet. This one and this one. We've now found p and we've found c. And in principle, that's what they have to be equal to. Right? They have to be, so you take this expression for C and you plug it into that expression for P. But before doing that, let's just think, think, uh, think a little bit ahead. What we would like is we want to look at, we don't want to have these time steps being very large. We want them to be relatively small. So if we want them to be relatively small, we should really be only concerned with the largest contribution to P and to C. So what terms contribute the most? Well, delta t is small, so square root of 1 plus something times delta t, this is going to be a small contribution, and there's already a delta t out here. So we can, in fact, do an approximation. When delta t is small, we could say that this is just approximately sigma star delta t. Plus, things that are going to go to 0 faster than delta t. So this is little o delta t. Does everyone know the notation little o delta t? So let me remind you. This means that the limit of whatever is there divided by delta t equals zero. Okay? So it just means something that goes to zero faster than delta t. Such as delta t squared or delta t to any power bigger than 1. Okay? But there are a lot of other things that can go to 0 faster, but in this case, it's sufficient to, to know that. So if I have that approximation for c, then I also know that there's a nice simple approximation for p. Look, p is way up at the top of the screen there, so if I substitute uh, this expression I have for c into p, you get a nice simple expression. 1 plus mu star minus a half sigma star squared all over sigma star square root delta t. And again, it's going to be, in this case, plus little o square root delta t, something that goes to zero faster than square root of delta t. Okay? So these are our two final results. So let me write that. This is our key new result for today. So let's recap. Okay. If you start with 
the observation of the data and you compute it the mean of those returns, the log returns, to make our binomial model match that behavior, all we need to do is choose this probability and choose the asset to grow at every node like this. A goes to E to the sigma square root delta T, sigma star square root delta T times A, the minus sigma star square root delta T times A. That's the result. Then this replicates the behavior that we observe in the market. Okay, questions? Okay, I think it's about time for a break. So let's take a little 10 minute break, okay? Okay, so just, uh, I would just like to point out a small typo that I made here. Um, this should be square root delta t in these three places. It's sort of obvious you're taking the square root of something and I missed the square root, okay? So square root, square root, square root. I drew it correctly in the diagram and I, and what that tells you is there should also be a square root there and here. There we go. Okay. So in all of these things here, in fact, there's square roots. So it's a little o square root delta t, stuff that goes to zero faster than square root delta t. Little o square root delta t divided by square root delta t is zero. Square root delta t, little o square root delta t. You can fill that in on your own. Okay, so um, so what I'd like to do in this last part before giving you your, your little quiz is to talk about, now that we have a discrete model that um, matches the behavior of the returns over the daily returns, we can ask a couple of interesting questions. One is, what is the continuous time limit of this model? So what happens when delta t goes to zero? What type of distribution does the asset A have? Then the next question is, what is the behavior of asset A when we change to risk neutral probability? Because at this point, what we've done is we've figured out the real world evolution and we've made the asset behave as it does in the real world. But we know when we want to do derivative valuation, we have to go ahead and calculate risk neutral probabilities. And maybe the behavior under risk neutral measure is quite different than real world. Okay, so those two questions we'll ask, answer. And then we'll end. Uh, okay, so first of all, the continuous time limit. Well, imagine, so the idea is that we're, we've got some big time frame here, zero capital T, and we break this up into pieces. And of course, each one of these is delta T. And delta T is big T over N. And we're going to keep big T finite. And we're going to take N going to plus infinity. So in other words, delta t going down to zero. So we'd like to make this mesh become extremely fine. And in terms of the one period steps, we can see there's an interesting simple behavior, uh, or at least an interesting interpre simple interpretation of the behavior. At every step we go up or down by, by a small amount, um, by a small percentage amount, that's the sigma star square root delta t, and we can see as delta t gets smaller and smaller, they become closer and closer together. The sizes of the steps get closer and closer, but the number of them get larger. So it's not obvious whether or not this actually converges to anything reasonable at the start. It's not obvious. Something's getting small, something's getting big. Maybe they cancel in the right way, maybe they don't. So we'd like to answer the question, what is the asset price distribution at capital T? And to answer that, we can simply just use this recursion relation that we have, and we know that this becomes sigma star square root delta t. We'll get x1 plus x2 plus dot 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 all the way up to xn. Right? Every time, every time we step, we go up or down, and the up or down is decided upon by x, by this little Bernoulli random variable x. So what we'll do is focus on what's up in the exponential. Call that random variable 
uh, let's call that random variable capital X. And in fact, why not capital X subscript T, big T? And then we can ask questions about that random variable. Well, it's a sum of independent random variables. In fact, those are just Bernoullis. So there are a sum of independent random variables that have finite variance. So what do you know about such type of random variables? In distribution, this becomes normal with some mean and some variance, right? We don't know what, what mean and what variance. We have to figure it out. So the arrow with the D above it means in distribution, okay? Limit in distribution. And this is by CLT. So all we have to do is compute the mean and the variance of this for any finite capital N, and then take the limit as N goes to infinity. And see, do we get a finite mean? Do we get a finite variance? If we do, then things have converged. And we know what it would converge to. So the expectation under P of X capital T, well, that's pretty simple. It's sigma star delta T times N. There's equal number of them, times the expected value of any one of these. Right? What's the expected value of any one? 2p minus 1, remember? Do you agree? What was 2p minus 1 equal to? Well, if we just flip back, we can see, okay, well, here's P, okay? So if you multiply it by 2 and subtract the 1, you just get this ratio, okay? So that's going to be mu star minus a half sigma star squared all over sigma star, and then there's the square root delta T. So we're going to take T, delta T going to 0. So we can ignore the plus little o delta t in the end. We don't need it. But if you want for completeness, you can put that there. And now we can see delta t goes down to zero. Same thing as n going to infinity. What happens? Well, let's look at all of the factors that we've got in terms of big N. This here is capital T over square root over n. This here capital T over N. Multiply those two together, I'll get T over N, but I also have a factor of N there. So I'll just get T times this constant plus something that goes to zero. So in the limit, I will simply get this constant times T. And then there's a sigma star out front, so the sigma stars cancel. And I'm going to go, I'm going a little bit fast here, but this is sort of simple, it's, it's algebra. Check it on your own if you get lost. But at the end of the day, it's just computing these expectations and doing a little bit of algebra. Okay. So that's one. We've got that. And the variance, the variance of this random variable, well, again, we've got a sum of, I'm just scrolling up to show you what x is again. It's a sum of independent things um, that are identically distributed. And we've got a sigma star square root delta t there. So if we take the variance, we'll get sigma star delta squared delta t times n times the variance of any one. And we already know that we fixed the variance to be sigma star squared um, Actually, sorry, we, 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 we fixed the total variance to be that. So the variance of this guy is 1 minus 2p minus 1 all squared. Okay? And I'll remind you again what this 2p minus 1 all squared is going to be this. It will be that. And here we see something that's going to zero. 
being added or subtracted from 1. This is not going to 0. This is big T over N, so the Ns will cancel, and this just gives me big T. So in the limit, as n goes to infinity, this is very simple again. Or delta t going down to zero, this becomes sigma star squared times big T. So what we found is that the limiting distribution is normal with mean mu star minus a half sigma star squared times t, it scales linearly with, t with time, which is nice, and the variance scales linearly with time, which is also nice. And we can write the asset price equals this initial asset price times e to the xt. So such kind of, such kind of random variables, which, is the, which are written as the exponential of a normal these are called log normal random variables. Oh, and I should be careful here. This is the limiting distribution under the measure P, okay? Um, equals in distribution, equals that, and let's say, um, let's put, trying to think where I want to put the P in here. I'll just put it there, okay? Sort of at the end of the arrow, okay? Okay, this is a log normal distribution, log normal distributed random variable. You could write this in terms of, in terms of a standard normal. Sometimes people write it like this. where z is just a standard normal random variable. So all I've done is I've introduced something which is in distribution the same as x capital T. So this is its mean, and if you compute the variance of this last term, since this is standard normal, the variance of this is the same as the variance of x. So they're equal in mean, equal in variance, they're normally distributed, so they're the same in distribution. Okay. So you sometimes see it written that way as well. Okay. Now we can actually uh, understand why I put that minus a half sigma squared in the definition of the return. Remember back, way back here, I did this sort of odd thing. I said we have the observations, we compute the mean of those observations, and we look at the, uh, and we get an estimate of that. And that estimate, I said, suppose we write it as mu star minus a half sigma star squared delta t. And we were saying, why sigma star? Why, why minus a half sigma star squared? And I said, for now, take it at fate. Later on, it'll mean something. It's called a convexity adjustment or convexity correction. Well, let's see why, what does it mean. Why did that come in useful? Well, suppose I asked you to calculate the expected value of the asset A capital T. What is it equal to? Well, it's A0 as the expected value of E to the XT. And if you remember your moment generating function for standard normals, so first of all, I'll just write this in terms of the z random variable here. So a uh, reminder, MGF of normal, so you take the expected value of e to the uz, that's e to the one-half u squared, okay, if z is normal, 0, 1. So I can use that result and you can see, well, that the u there is sigma star squared t. If I square it, I'm going to get a half sigma star squared times t, and that kills that half. That kills that, that, that term. <laughs> so you get just mu star t.
And it only killed that term because that term was present. So if it was absent, I would find that the mean is not the initial value grown at the rate of mu star. So there's the interpretation. Mu star, when we write it in the way that I did, in terms of calibration, mu star becomes the expected continuously compounded return of the asset. Okay? Sometimes simply called the drift or the expected return. Okay? So this gives you the interpretation why I subtracted the half sigma squared in the beginning. Questions? Nope. Okay. Um, hmm. thinking it's getting a little bit late. I don't know if I want to do the other thing. Okay, let's start it and see where I get to in seven minutes. Okay, so the last, last point that I wanted to do was look at, how, look at the risk neutral measure, Q. So how would I calculate the risk neutral probability here? We need the money market account. Since we're in continuous time setting, it makes sense to think of the money market account growing in a continuous way, so over some small time step like this. The condition of risk neutrality to calculate the risk neutral measure, Q, would be that um, A, equals e to the minus r delta t, that's the discount factor, times the expected value of a one time step later, q times a e to the sigma star square root delta t, plus 1 minus q times a e to the negative sigma star square root delta t. And we see one very nice thing, one very nice fact, is that um, this a cancels everywhere. And what does that tell me? That tells me that this risk neutral probability doesn't matter where in the gigantic tree I am. No matter where in the tree you are, it's the same Q. Q is independent. So there's some giant tree and you're in some node there. Q is always the same. Probability of going up, always the same. And in fact, that was an outcome of the previous calculation. The probability of P going up was always the same. It didn't mean that there was no, um, it wasn't obvious that because P is always the same doesn't imply Q is always the same. It doesn't have to be. But in this case, it turns out to be. So here we'll get Q equals, if you just solve the system, you'll get E to the minus R, E to the R, sorry, negative sigma, sigma star, square root, and negative star, square root. So you get that expression. So this is a, another very useful result. It's not so obvious any interpretation of that result is, but if you do the following thing, look at small delta t. What does q look like for small delta t? So in the numerator, we get one plus r delta t, right, exponential e to the x, so here's one of these Taylor expansion things again. It's approximately one plus x. So we get that plus a half x squared, okay, we're going to need that term, plus dot, 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 minus 1 minus sigma star square root delta t, plus 1 half sigma star squared delta t, plus dot, dot, dot. In the denominator, you get 1 plus sigma star square root delta t, plus 1 half sigma star squared, square, uh, there's no square root there because I squared it dot, 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 minus the exact same thing, except there's a minus sign there,
eventually I'm going to stop writing this star on the sigma. It's purely at this stage, it's a reminder of the fact that it comes from calibrating. It comes from calibrating the historical data. It's the historical estimate. Okay, and if you look at the, these expressions, there's a series of cancellations. Um, let me highlight them. This cancels with that. Um, there's a cancellation of this term with this term. This one and this one also cancel. So everything that I've highlighted it goes away. And you end up with sigma star square root delta t plus r minus a half sigma star squared delta t. And the denominator, the only thing that's left is 2 sigma star square root delta t plus higher order stuff, things that go away. And now we just simplify that. That's 1 half 1 plus That's Q. Now remember, what was P? There's kind of a miracle happening here. Okay, that's what P was. The only difference between Q and P for at least small delta T's is what I just highlighted. Instead of having mu, you get r. The return of the asset, or that should be mu star, I guess. Um, right? Instead of mu star, you get, you get r. So the risk-neutral probabilities are actually exactly the same as the real, as the real world ones, except you have risk-free rate in place of the drift of the asset, instead of the expected return of the asset. And that, that makes a lot of sense. So if you think quickly about it, if you think, suppose I repeated the calculation we did before for the assets distribution, what would A capital, we know that we would be able to write A capital T to be equal to this, and XT under the Q measure should be what? Normal? What? Its mean would be this and its variance would be the same. That's the surprising fact. So you can check that calculation for you. Go ahead and check that this is true for, for under the measure Q. So there's two surprising facts. The variance under the P measure and the Q measure are identical. Oh, that's not delta T, that's full T. <laughs> that's full T. The variance under the P measure and the Q measure are identical, but the drifts are modified. The return of the asset under P is mu, and the return of the asset under Q is R. As expected, right? We kind of expected that. That's the definition of risk neutral. Expected returns are equal to the risk-free rate. Okay, so you can try to flush in this detail for yourself, this last part. It's just some more algebra, more or less the same as what we just went through for P. Okay, so let's, um, I'm going to pause the, uh,